Is there anyone to speak? Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to you all in Usern's first aid workshop, which we have called Faith, standing for first aid for international health. For those of you who are joining a Usern event for the first time. UCERN is a universal scientific education and research network, which is a nonprofit organization and network for non military scientific execution and policy making. We are organized for advancement of ethical and professional scientific research and education. We aim to promote scientific research education for young doctors and students to guide them through the research world and ahead towards publishing research articles that can help to be a better change for our world. As our organization have, has several 
offices worldwide, it has helped to gather the world's top 1% scientists to be reached by interested groups and collaborate their ideas and turn it into practical researches to push the world further. I won't be long, but our website is free to be accessed by everyone to create an account and join their pers perspective interest group for new, for new collaborations. UCERN has three members from all five continents. You can check if your country is a part of UCERN, and if it's not, then you can present yourself as an ambassador for us. Now we will present the, the president of UCERN, Dr. Nima Rizai, for the opening speech. Go ahead, Dr. Nima Rizai. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear my voice? Yes, we can hear you, doctor. Okay. So it's my pleasure to officially start the uh, uh, first aid in emergency medicine meeting phase. And uh, it's uh, because of, uh, I mean, amazing efforts of the US and junior ambassadors who did a great job to make it possible. So this is a three days event to promote the knowledge of the, I mean, medical students and uh, other students in different disciplines about the medical emergency to the international community. So in three days, there are different lectures by, I mean, amazing lectures from different countries. And the first day will be in English language. The second day will be in uh, Persian, if I'm right. And the third day will be in Indonesia. So at the first day, we are the host of the, I mean, we have the chance to host the uh, youth and junior ambassadors from Indonesia, uh, Bahrain, Kazakhstan, Kenya, Gambia, and India. And as far as I know, more than 700 individuals have already been registered for this Congress. And we expect about, uh, uh, I mean, uh, more than 500 uh, I mean, attendees per day. And uh, they are from uh, 23 countries, so from different countries. And at the first day, we have three lecturers. Uh, I mean, I mean, they are very busy, but they kindly accepted to join us for, uh, I mean, uh, their lectures from United States, from UK, and from Kenya. So I really hope that I mean the, the juniors in different countries will have a fruitful, uh, I mean, hear the fruitful lectures during three days and increase the the the, the knowledge about the emergency medicine. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nimar Zai. As, as, and as Dr. Nimar Zai stated, our faith program is continued through, through three days, today, tomorrow, and after tomorrow, in English, Persian, and Indonesian. Um, next, we move on to introduce the heart group. The heart group is health and art group, which is a part of UCERN, aiming to blend aiming to blend the cooperation of medical doctors and artists in order to push sick children to fight their diseases through treatment, raise their hopes towards recovery. The Heart Group is an international network where all members are volunteers seeking to lift the spirits of young patients. Uh, the Heart Group has organized the eighth annual IFPP, which is an international painting competition for the children worldwide. You can now send your paintings and the deadline is on the 20th of June, which is open until then. And we have it annually done virtually and live throughout the world. Um, now we move on to present the hard group clip. Can uh, the coordinator please play the clip?
thank the heart group for their performances for the children. Now we move on uh, to Mr. Jan Juarez Casanga joining us from the Kenya Red Cross Society to talk about the recognition of emergency situation, signs and responses about the CPR guidelines and the poisons and OSHA. Please, here you go, Mr. Jan Juarez Casanga. Yeah, thank you so much, Farida. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you clearly. Wow, thank you so much. So hello, uh, guys. My name is Januaris Kasanga. I work at the Emergency Operations Center of the Kenya Red Cross in Nairobi. Besides that, I'm also a seasoned uh, first aid instructor. And uh, I'm a disaster manager by profession. So I'm privileged to be here today to share with you uh, some three topics about first aid. I'll be talking about uh, incident management. Secondly, I will be talking uh, briefly about uh, CPR. In full, CPR is cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Then uh, we shall also talk just briefly on issues to do with the uh, poisoning. But before we get to business, it is good first to begin with the, the known, going to the unknown. First aid is for everyone, first of all. It is about people for everyone and everyone. So I will say it is a basic skill for each and everyone. Because you may never know when the emergency will come. Besides that, uh, First aid is like introduction to medicine. And uh, medicine is based on research. So whenever we are talking about first aid, we are talking about skills which are universal internationally. As a result, we usually follow certain guidelines and the guidelines are bound to change in every year. So maybe for all the people who are in this call, and they have not uh, had an opportunity to be trained on first aid, perhaps I will request you in your maybe country, it is good to enroll on first aid. So moving forward, it is also a privilege to me, today is a World uh, Blood Donor Day. And uh, the objective for this year is donating blood as an act of solidarity. So to me, it is an honor to be here to just uh, in solidarity with you to spread this knowledge about first aid. So um, I have some video here that I wanted to show you guys. Then from there, I'm going to talk about the incident of management. So I had shared the video. Oh, I'm gonna text him, see if he found Oh, Johnny dear. 
Hi, James. We make jewels. Fancy Please you. Please don't. Ooh. Cass. It's not, a funny oh, it's not even funny now. Oh, let me just get his number. Can you pause the video? So now, assuming that you are this gentleman and you are the first one to arrive at that accident incident, yeah? what are some of the first considerations that you need to put in place to make sure that uh, everything is, is put in place? So, uh, going on with uh, my presentation, I just want to give you not a formula, but a guideline that one can use whenever they encounter any incidents. So please share my presentation. Let's go back to my presentation. Remove the video. Thank you so much. So the first thing that you are supposed to do when you encounter any incident, not only a road traffic accident, it can be a fire incident, it can be even a protest somewhere and people have been injured, it can be a drowning situation and all that. Eh? As a first aider, or rather even as a lay person, you are supposed to assess the situation first. When we are assessing the situation, the first thing that you need to put in consideration is you need to ask yourself what happened, yeah? Besides that, using your senses, you need to ask yourself if you continue to stay in that incident or rather that scene of accident, what is likely to happen, yeah? Then after assessing the situation, maybe you can go ahead and make the area safe. You are making the area safe, first of all, for you, as a good Samaritan, you are making the area safe for you as a first aider. And besides that, the second or other in priority, people who you should make priority to is um, the bystanders. Those people who have come to witness, it is good also to have consideration of them. Then also lastly, you need also to take care of the casualties or rather those people who have been injured to make sure they don't suffer further injuries. After making the area safe, it is also good to consider that the next thing now that you need to do is to do is now to engage, or rather you need to do first aid to the casualties. Make sure you have the key essentials. Among them is a first aid kit. Among the important things in a first aid kit um, is gloves for protection purposes. Besides that, you also need to have uh, bandages if it is a trauma incident and any other requirement that might be required one to respond to an incident setup. Um, it is also good to get help. It is good to have uh, emergency numbers. Eh? Perhaps you can call the police. Yeah, I know in most places uh, people use 911. Here in our country, we use a 999 to inform the police or any other uh, outline numbers that are being used in the country so that you can call for backup and that. Then the last thing that you are supposed to do is aftermath. In aftermath, uh, we advise people to do documentation or other documentation of what has happened or rather you record 
In the aftermath, you can also do a report because it is also important legally to have it as evidence. Besides that, in aftermath, you do what we call a clearance of the scene. In aftermath, you also do things like dressing or other re reuniting uh, those guys who have been in, an, in one way or the other the attached to the family members, you facilitate the dressing bit. In aftermath, you can also sort the aspect of uh, mental health. Yeah, for those guys who have been directly involved and also indirectly involved, you give them psychosocial first aid and uh, long term, you follow up on their psychosocial uh, support well being and all that. In aftermath, it is also advised that you clear the scene. So this is just a guideline to just use whenever you encounter any emergency, be it a small emergency, be it a mass casualty incident, be it even a large emergency, which requires a lot of resources. You can just use this guideline. It is not a formula, it is just a guideline. At times, you, uh, because every uh, incident or every disaster is unique on its own way, at times you will be required just sometimes to assess and perhaps seek for help, just call for help if you cannot offer maybe the emergency aid. Yeah. Besides, at times you will do the assessment of the situation, then you go ahead to make the area safe, do emergency aid, get help till you do the aftermath and all that. So that's it for incident management. Uh, maybe moving forward, we can go to CPR. On CPR, maybe if someone has a question, you can type it on the chat box. Eh? Then through the moderator, we are going to take up some few, or we can plan on how to follow up with the questions and all that. So briefly about uh, CPR, First of all, CPR is being done to someone who is unconscious and not breathing. When I'm talking about CPR, I'm talking about uh, in full is cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Cardio is for the heart. Yeah. When you talk about cardio, we are talking about the heart. Pulmonary, it is about the lungs. Yeah. And the resuscitation is that aspect of you want to bring back or rather you want to restart the heart. You want to resuscitate this person to us, maybe a state of normalcy and all that. So any casualty who has gone to unconsciousness and the, uh, first of all, if they are breathing, yeah, and they don't have any trauma injuries, uh, we place them on what we call a recovery position. But now, if the situation worsens, yeah, and you get, or rather you encounter um, casualty who is unconscious and they are not breathing. In other words, they are in what we call clinical death before the brain uh, switches off. You are advised to do what we call cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Of course, uh, I had earlier uh, said that uh, first aid is medicine and the medicine keeps on changing because it is based on the research. First aid or other CPR amidst COVID uh, because of issues to do with safety and all that. Eh? Nowadays, we are advised to do what we call ants only CPR, or rather, what we call uh, compressions only CPR. So, nowadays, instead of doing the normal 30 chest compressions followed by two um, rescue breaths, applying to all the categories of people, both adult, child, and infants, what we do is we initiate what we call ants only CPR, where one is expected to do 100 to 120 chest compressions per minute. Of course, ensuring that they compress, they compress the chest to a depth of four to five centimeters uh, in terms of depth. Then after two minutes, you are allowed to reassess the casualties perhaps if breathing and uh, pulse are present. If breathing and pulse is back, you will now put the casualty on a recovery position because now you will have an unconscious casualty who is uh, uh, breathing. As a result, you put, the, you put them on a recovery position. Otherwise, um, in interest of time, 
I'll, uh, I'll just um, encourage you uh, or anyone who is in need of maybe knowing more about the new guidelines about the, the CPR and first aid, you can go to American Heart Association. They will give you information on anything that you need to know about that. Uh, let's quickly switch to poisoning. And um, first of all, poisoning uh, by definition is something which when it gets into contact with the body system, rather with the body, can cause either permanent or can cause uh, maybe a temporary uh, damage to the body. Poisons enter the body through uh, four different forms. The first one and the most common is through ingestion, through mouth, yeah. Besides that, it can enter the body through, you can inhale poison. And besides that, it can be absorbed. Yeah. Besides that, it can enter the body through injection. There are uh, examples in, in each and every. Yeah? yeah. A good example of injection is maybe if someone commits suicide yeah? and they choose to take maybe pesticide and all that, God forbid. Another form of poisoning injection, a, a good example is things like stings, uh, snake bites, and all that. Then there's also the aspect of absorption, where uh, mostly it is aspect of the chemical beat. It can also, others chemicals can enter the body through inhalation and all that. A good and a common example, uh, perhaps, is when there are riots or rather when there is uh, unrest, sometimes police use tear gas to, for crowd controlling and all that. Now, what is the first aid for each and uh, every um, type of? First, when it comes to ingestion, eh, according to the new guidelines, eh, they are advising us to take the casualty immediately to hospital without considering giving other things like water, milk, and all that. Actually, we are being advised to give the casualties what we call activated charcoal. Activated charcoal, yeah? That is for ingested poisons. If it is for these others like uh, absorption, inhalation, uh, and injected poisons, it is good to have information about the poison. And um, it is good also to be aware of, about what we call the material safety data sheet, where it contains all information, including contacts. Whenever we have um, unfortunate situations where someone gets into contact with such poisons and all that. Otherwise, uh, that's it for my presentation. I had only 20 minutes. Perhaps through the moderator, Farida, uh, maybe you can pick a few questions as we go on, carry on. For the questions, uh, we have uh, the chat box provided for the questions. We will have a Q&A session later. After all of the speakers have presented, we will moderate the uh, questions and answers after. Okay, that is, that is noted, uh, Madam Farida. Otherwise, yeah. uh, thank you so much. I'm looking right. forward. We thank you so much, Mr. Janwaris Kasanga, for your time and for your effort. That was great. Um, is your presentation? Um, next, we have Dr. Yasser Rashid, the consultant and clinical lead in the emergency anesthesia in John Radcliffe Hospital from Oxford University Hospitals whom will be speaking about the respiratory emergencies. We welcome you, Dr. Yasser Rashid. Hello, everyone. And uh, good afternoon and good evening to everyone who is on the meeting. I assume you're all from different parts of the globe. So um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this um, uh, meeting. 
I didn't know anything about USERN until Aisha contacted me. Thank you, Aisha. I, I, I think this is a very beautiful form that you're spreading medical knowledge around the world. Um, uh, really nice to see all this. Um, my heart really goes out to those children who presented the heart um, presentation. That was so beautiful. Um, I wish them all very well and hope they, they achieve their um, great success in their lives and get on with their life. So that was very beautiful. So today I was asked to do respiratory emergencies um, and I assume that parts of this meeting, uh, participants are from Allied Medical Sciences and, and um, some of you are uh, into the medicine field. So first part of presentation is about choking, which will apply to almost everyone. Uh, including the general public. And the second part will be a bit more medical, um, although everyone is happy, uh, everyone should, is welcome to see all that about asthma. So let's get on and I'll share my presentation and we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Right. Can you all see my presentation? Can you see my presentation? Yeah, it's clear, it's on the screen. Yeah, thank you. So, um, as I said, the first part is about choking. Um, when I actually woke up today morning, I think one of the news that I found was related to choking. So, um, the Old India Institute of Medical Sciences has issued a warning about swallowing um, bigger um, food objects like momos, because recently, one week ago, a guy in India died um, after choking on a momo. So, um, and there are so many, then I Google choking, and if you do, there's so much that comes up. It's so common than you think. Only last week, there was another person, a social media celebrity who died after choking on a kebab. So uh, why I want to highlight this is that choking is probably commoner than we think. And the, there is a way to respond uh, immediately if you are a bystander, if you are there next to them, you could probably save a life if you are, um, you know what to do. So let's get on and see what we can do if we um, encounter a case of choking. So uh, what happens basically if, if choking occurs, that means the food gets trapped somewhere in the airway that is around in the larynx or the voice box, if people put it that way, or somewhere um, around below that um, in the trachea or the windpipe. So if that happens, the patient cannot breathe air in, and that leads to uh, prevention of oxygen getting into the body. Now, we all have to understand that our oxygen reserves are only for three minutes. If um, the we cannot provide breathing for more than three minutes, our brain gets depleted of oxygen and that can lead to cells dying. Now, we also know that the brain cells or the neurons cannot usually do not regenerate. And if that happens, that can lead to severe permanent damage in the brain. So it's very vital that we provide immediate um, therapy or immediate relief or do something about it immediately. So what do you do? If you see somebody choking, the first thing um, you check on them, you ask them a question whether if they can speak, that means they can actually, um, they have a passage through which the air goes into the lungs. You cannot speak until you, you can um, have airflow through the lungs. So if they can speak, then probably you can ask them to cough. Um, if they are able to cough, with a cough, they can actually clear their airway. They can clear any debris or any food particles automatically. So the first thing is to ask the patient to cough, which will help them to get um, that object or a foreign body out through their mouth. Now, if they cannot cough or if they cannot make any noise, then you have to be very concerned about what is happening because that means this is a very serious situation, which means they are not able to take air into their lungs. They're not able to breathe. 
So at that moment in time, you have to do some uh, very urgent uh, procedures or maneuvers. So as we say, if they can't cough, then they can't help, but um, you can sometimes help them um, if, if you, they lean forward and you can support their upper body with one hand and help them lean forward and cough. Sometimes that helps to cough it out, okay? That's the first thing, cough it out. If it doesn't work, then the second thing is slap it out. What do you do when you say slap it out? You use the heel of your hand. It should be the heel of your hand. You hit the heel of their hand between the shoulder blades of the patient. So between the two scapula, if the medical students, uh, if allied health people, they can understand between the two shoulder blades, you have to slap hard between the two shoulder bl blades. You can do this up to five times, right? So as you're doing that, what happens is you cause a compression and that can lead to increased pressure in the lungs and push the foreign body or a foot particle out through their mouth. You need to constantly also work out and see throughout the process whether they have coughed it out. Probably if they cough it out, they will start talking and that will be a sort of response that you'll get and that will make you um, have feel better is if they are getting better, if they start to talk. Now, if um, they don't do that, um, now other thing that I wanted to mention here is also, if you look into this picture, this is for little kids or infants because a lot of children are very curious and they will go around. They, have, they don't have, uh, if you look at children's mouths, they don't have a proper dentition at the back of their mouths. So that's why they are very keen to put things in and they go back of the mouth and then they swallow them. It could be food particles. It could be commonly what's seen as coins. So in those little children like infants, you put them in this very position, get their head down, place them a hand under their chest and then slap with the heel of the hand at the back. So always check for anything that comes out through the mouth. If you actually see things coming out to the mouth and they start crying or they start coughing, that's an indication that the foreign body is coming out and air is going into their lungs. Every time any person makes a sound means the air is going into the lungs. So you can do that in the children, or as I said, you can um, hit between the shoulder blades in the adults. Now, um, if that doesn't work, so you've done first step, you have asked them, to cough, it didn't work. Second step, you have slapped at the back, it didn't work. Then you try to squeeze it out. Now, how do you do that? You um, use a technique um, in what we call here in UK is abdominal thrusts, while as in the Americas, it's called hemlick maneuver. I don't know what you call that in your part of the world, but if you keep it simply as abdominal thrust, that means you have put some pressure on the abdomen. So what you do is you, um, you will um, clasp one hand, like make a clasp and put your hand on back and then put it between the belly button and the xiphi sternum or the breastbone uh, of the patient. And then you pull sharply inwards and upwards. And I can, there's a, there's a diagram roughly. If you see this, this um, lady, what she's doing, she's made a fist of her, of her left hand. She's put a right hand on top and she's put it right between the breastbone and the belly button of this child. Um, and then she pulls it back and up sharply. And that's what you do is create a lot of pressure in the abdominal area, and that causes a huge amount of pressure into the lungs, which causes expulsion of the foreign body. So you can do this as your step number four. So first, try to talk to them. Second, try to make them cough, ask them to cough. Step three, uh, slap them at the back. And step four is doing the abdominal thrust. Now, this is where your limitation ends. You can't do anything more than this without any medical help. This is what you can do with your bare hands. You don't need any medical 
equipment. You don't need anything up to this point. So you can keep on doing these. Um, you can keep on repeating between the abdominal thrusts and the uh, five slaps. You can keep on doing these cycles till help arrives. At the same time, while you're doing that, or you've seen somebody who is not able to talk, he's not able to, they're not able to cough, I think you should immediately call for help as well while you start doing all these cycles of um, slaps and thrusts. But if at this point you feel the patient's becoming unconscious or patient's not responded and patient's not um, um, conscious anymore, at that point, the whole process stops. You go uh, default, go for a CPR, right? Means, means all these your maneuvers has not worked. So you at this point will uh, start going for a CPR. Now, uh, which means you're trying to support the vital organs that is heart and the brain. That's the idea of a CPR. So um, start with these four stages, call for help. If things don't work, if the patient becomes unconscious, start CPR means the oxygen levels are so low that they are not able to support their vital organs, which is brain and heart. So um, if you do not provide CPR, the chances of them dying are very, very high. Rather, I would say there's no way out, they will die. But if you do provide CPR, you double their chances of living and uh, surviving. And the moment they become unresponsive, you should start CPR because every second of that moment onwards counts. If you cannot maintain the vital organs like brain and heart, the patient's going to die definitely. So um, that's one of the important things, the steps that you go through. First step, speak to them. Second step, ask them to cough. Third step, start slapping at the back. Fourth step, do the abdominal thrust or um, harmonic maneuver. Fourth step, do the CPR if they are unconscious. Um, that's the summary of what you should do if you see a patient choking. But do not forget, while you are doing all these things, please try to call for help. Yeah, as soon as possible, um, call for medical help in your whatever numbers you have in your country. So any questions so far with regards to choking? I tried to keep this presentation as minimum as possible considering the time limitations we have. So um, I'll move on to asthma now. Um, if you do have any questions, please do ask them. I'm happy to answer them later on. Okay, let's move on to um, acute asthma. Now, I think the, the presentation topic said status asthmaticus. Now, we have moved on to um, a more, more uh, the term has evolved into acute severe asthma. However, I'm just going to overview the whole acute asthma scenario and we'll come to the acute severe asthma as well. So, um, so what happens in acute asthma is that the patient presents with more shortness of breath or uh, dyspnea as it's called, or they might be presenting with a lot of V's. The, when the patient's present in acute asthma, from a medical point of view, in assessing acute severity of acute asthma, it is the clinical signs that are more important than symptoms to guide your management. So, so um, we'll go through those signs. So as much as you're, it's important to see and ask the patients what's happening, you also have signs to pick up uh, if they get worse. So based on the signs, the whole um, uh, scenario changes um, uh, in different ways and uh, which will be, for example, if a patient comes with moderate acute asthma, so they will have increasing symptoms than normal. So for example, they were okay and they started with some wheeze and it got worse. That means they have kind of worsened and you could call it as moderate acute asthma, 
but you're looking at clinical signs. And one of the key signs in asthma is peak expiratory flow rate. So the peak expiratory flow rate should be more than 50% of the best or predicted for that patient. And they do not have anything else. They just have increased symptoms, which is wheeze or um, um, shortness of breath. And their peak expiratory flow rate is more than 50%. More than 75% is nearly normal. So more than 50% or less than 75% and more than 50% is where you, you put moderate acute asthma into the picture. Now, moving on, we go on to another stage, which is called acute severe asthma. In acute severe asthma, well, all of them will have symptoms anyway at this point. What you're looking for is peak expiratory flow rate of 33 to 50% of the best or predicted. So the peak expiratory flow rate has decreased because we all know, especially the medical students here, asthma is an um, expiratory airway disease. So it's more uh, of a problem to, um, it's the airway that's more responsive. So uh, they cannot produce a good expiratory flow. And then the flow is between 33 to 50%. You call it as acute severe asthma. The respiratory rate usually is more than 25 uh, breaths per minute, and they are tachycardic. Tachycardic means their heart rate is more than 100. But here I put it as 110. That's where the classification comes from. But still, if they are more than 100, you should be worried in terms of more like acute severe asthma. And one of the key things that you look for in acute severe asthma, you ask them any sentence and they probably they will be so, um, they will not be able to complete a sentence in a single breath because they feel, again, short of breath because they cannot breathe in enough, they cannot expire enough. So at this point, they need to break the sentence. And that's, that's one of the old classical examples of acute severe asthma, which continues to this date. Now, these are two um, stages of severe asthma. But what I'm going to tell you, the third stage, which is probably the most important and could be correlated to the old um, term of status asthmaticus, which is called as life-threatening asthma. And life-threatening asthma is what, as medical students, you should be able to pick up, not as medical students, I would say senior medical students and junior doctors, that's crucial to your clinical knowledge of medicine. Now, again, the whole uh, approach mostly will be lying on clinical signs. And primarily, those signs are respiratory, or uh, cardiovascular. So in respiratory, um, if you look at, they can have cyanosis. They can be, um, their conscious level be, will be low. So their GCS will drop. Uh, they can have signs of respiratory fatigue, uh, which means they will not be breathing enough for their respiration. They will have tachypnea. They will have a reduced peak flow rate, as we mentioned. They might not be able to complete their sentences or most likely they will never be able to complete sentences at this stage. And their speech will be confused, means their uh, higher functions, higher neuro neurological functions will not be adequate. In terms of cardiovascular system, as I mentioned earlier, they could be tachycardic and they could have hypotension because there's a lot of pressure generated during um, acute asthma in the chest, which impedes the blo blood flow into the heart. So um, if the patient has got life-threatening asthma, in that situation, the PEFR will be less than 33% predicted for that patient. So again, here, throughout this classification, we have been talking about peak expiratory flow rate. So you should all get familiar with how you use the equipment for peak expiratory flow rate, which should be available in all hospitals in the world. It's not a very expensive equipment, but if you see one in your hospital, you should go and try and do it, um, do it uh, 
in a in a proper manner. You can do your own peak flow expiratory rates. Um, yeah, um, using it properly and cleaning it, uh, keeping it aseptic as much as possible. And in these patients, the peak expiratory flow rate will be less than 33%. Um, you can imagine how much tight their uh, airways are at this stage. They can only um, breathe in almost less than 33% of what normal population can do. Um, their saturations, I'm sure most of you will be familiar with, this is the amount of oxygenation in the blood or the amount of oxygen carried by the hemoglobin. So, which is normally more than uh, 94 uh, or 90, around 97 to 98% in normal people. But in these patients, the saturations will be less than 92%. And their oxygen content in the blood will be less than eight kilopascals. But one of the key important things to detect life-threatening asthma is that CO2 carbon dioxide levels in the blood are within the normal range. Now, why do we say it's in the normal range? Because most of the times when asthma attack happens, people stop breathing faster. Their breath rate is increased, respiratory rate is increased. And usually when, present, when patients present with acute asthma, their CO2 level in the blood is low. But anytime, if you see a patient who presents acutely with uh, acute severe asthma or with an asthma attack and their CO2 levels in the blood become normal, that is a dangerous sign, it means they are not breathing fast enough to compensate um, for, um, because their oxygen level is so low that they cannot compensate that for that and their CO2 level starts become normal, or if it goes higher, then it becomes another stage of life-threatening asthma. But here, in life-threatening asthma, the CO2 becomes normal in the blood, and this is one of the key things to note. And that's why I put it in the bold as well. And as, as we mentioned earlier, they can have tachycardias, they will be exhausted, they, their GCS will be dropping, or they will have low blood pressure. Any of those signs, um, you will take the patient as life-threatening asthma, which means if you don't do anything about it very quickly, it's going to go worse and they will uh, progress, possibly even die from it. All right, so what do you do if you see a patient with life-threatening asthma? So you follow simple guidelines like A, B, C, D, like A is for airway, B is for breathing, C for circulation, D for their um, conscious level. So what do you do with airway? You give them 100% oxygen through a face mask, or you can use a face mask oxygen with a reservoir bag because then they breathe in 100% oxygen. And you try to achieve their target saturations of anything more than 94%. That's one thing you do. You try to get a cannula as well, IV cannula as soon as possible, because you might have to give them drugs to relieve the, the spasm in the lungs, um, in, in, to relieve them of asthma. So what drugs do you give? You give them hydrocortisone or steroids. Um, normally uh, we use anything 100 milligrams, six hourly. Um, they were using higher doses before, but 100 milligrams is now considered to be enough, um, has no advantage. Um, higher doses have no advantage than this. And you, you um, they're also given prednisone um, as higher doses of prednisone, like 40 to 50 milligrams for first three, four days to tide over with that um, inflammation of asthma. They can uh, also receive beta-2 agonist bronchodilators, which is typical example of that is uh, Ventolin or Salbutamol, about 2.5 to 5 milligram, and that is used through nebulizations. That means the, the drug goes directly into the lungs and it's driven by oxygen in, in asthma. While as if you use the same drugs in COPD, it's driven with air, but here you use oxygen. You can also give anticholinergic drugs like ipratropium bromide, uh, again, 0.5 milligram or 500 micrograms uh, two to six hourly, again, through nebulization. So you can use these two drugs through the nebulization routes. Um, if the patients don't get better, at that point, you can use further bronchodilators through the drip, 
and a common one that can be used is aminophylline. This drug is a very um, a difficult drug to use because it's got a narrow therapeutic window. It can cause more damage if there are higher um, levels in the blood. So you have to monitor this drug, doing checks daily and maintaining a level, which I mentioned here, 30 to 80 micromole micromoles per liter. But uh, the way to give this drug is you give five milligrams per kg as a loading dose, and then you have to start an infusion of this drug. So it's a drug that has to be used in very, uh, very monitored conditions. Um, and, and you have to be very careful with this drug. However, you can use magnesium, uh, about two grams IV, slowly, uh, slow IV over 20 minutes, because magnesium, again, is a bronchodilator. It helps to relieve the um, spasm in the bronchi which can help to release, um, relieve the asthma. So all of these together, combinations of these drugs is the typical therapy, but don't forget to oxygenate these patients. And, and on top of that, um, if they've got some in infection that has triggered the asthma, of course, you'll treat that infection, right? So this is the general way you treat asthma and life-threatening asthma. But if things get worse, of course, you will ask help throughout the process, if you're not able to met, achieve targets, you ask for senior help. Um, and if things don't improve at all, then you might have to go to your intensive care colleagues or anesthetic colleagues who might come and intubate the patient. Because usually the asthma uh, patients are young and they are otherwise fit and well, um, except for the asthma attack. So they need to be treated aggressively. So, so yeah, they might have to get intubated and ventilated at this stage if the things don't get better. Um, now, if the CO2 content in the blood is raised, it means it goes higher than the normal levels. So if it goes more than 5.5 kilopascals, then that is called as near fatal asthma, it means uh, they are heading and progressing towards uh, uh, state where they can die. So at this stage, they are indications for intubating these patients. So you should immediately call help from intensive care or anesthetic colleagues because they will need intubation at this stage. So uh, that's why when CO2 is normal, that is life-threatening asthma. When CO2 is low, um, then it's moderate asthma. And when CO2 in the blood goes higher than normal, that is near fatal asthma. That's when you have to ask help from anesthetic or ICU, right? So what are the, what are the signs that the patient's really heading towards uh, a, a, a near fatal situation? So their GCS drops, their, um, their respiration is paradoxical, they have bradycardia, means their heart rate is going down. These are all. Um, these are also um, signs of low oxygen in the blood, and the the chest is not moving up and down, which is called silent or quiet chest. You should immediately ask help. You should immediately call the intensive care uh, at this point. Um, and then, if you don't do anything, they can go into cardiac arrest. And why should they go into cardiac arrest? As I mentioned, their oxygen levels will be low. They can have severe bronchospasm. Again, that leads to no breathing. Again, low oxygen levels. They can have um, arrhythmias. As I mentioned, they can have tachycardias, all tachycardic arrhythmias. They can go into ventricular atrial tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, or ventricular fibrillation in the hand, which can lead to cardiac arrest. Um, also, they can, if they have um, other respiratory diseases, uh, they can have thin walls in the chest or blabs which can break and cause a pneumothorax. And sometimes the pneumothorax, because of high pressures in the asthma, can lead to a state called tension pneumothorax, which is a large pneumothorax on one side of the chest, which compresses all the major vessels in the chest, like aorta and superior and inferior vena cava, which leads to no blood circulation from and to the heart, which eventually leads to cardiac arrest as well. So various stages of asthma, as we mentioned, it could be um, moderate asthma, then life-threatening asthma, near fatal asthma, or finally leading to cardiac arrest. But at various stages, you can pick up signs 
and you can treat them. And if you find that they're going worse and worse, you can ask for help from the specialists in those areas. And if nothing um, happens until this stage, they go into cardiac arrest, you start CPR, um, which we mentioned earlier. So that's the asthma bit. Um, I have kept it very short and I hope I have not crossed 20 minutes. I don't know how long I have been speaking, um, but um, that's from me. Um, I'm happy to take any questions whenever you want, but I, I'm here for the moment. So I hope that was helpful to you guys. And um, once again, thank you, you sir. I, um, I'm, I'm glad I'm here. I'm talking about things to people who would hopefully be benefited by this. Thank you. We're glad you're here too, Dr. Yasser. Thank you so much for your presentation. And thank you so much for this great presentation and for your time. We will be having the Q&A session after all of the speakers have ended their presentation, which will be at, at the end. Uh, everyone can uh, write their questions in the chat box. We'll be having the Q&A session later. Uh, before we start the next presentation, I'd like to talk about how, we, how wonderful it is to have a borderless international scientific community like that of USERN. USERN has more than 19,990 members from all five continents and more than 600 advisory board members, including 19 Nobel Abel laureates. One of the unique features of USERN events is that they are including beautiful artistic performances and this event should be no exception. May I kindly ask the host to play the video for today. Thank you. Our first video was an, an artistic performance from Bahrain.
our second video was uh, performed by a group of students from Iran. Next up, we welcome Dr. Javed Shah, the Associate Professor of Medicine from Virginia Commonwealth School of Medicine, USA, whom will be talking about the cardiovascular emergencies. We welcome Dr. J uh, Javed Shah. Okay. Are you able to listen my, to my voice? Yeah, you're clear. Your voice is clear. Okay. Okay. Are you able to see the slides? Yeah, the slides are on the screen, you can see them. Good, let me take this thing out. Okay, thank you for the invitation. Um, again, my name is Javed. I'm one of the teaching attendings here at the local university in Virginia. So I just came from a long night shift and it's around 8, around 8.30 in the morning here in Virginia, this part of USA. Um, so I have been uh, asked to speak on uh, cardiac emergencies. So I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest in relation to this presentation. So I'm gonna uh, do a case-based presentation because um, from my experience as a teaching attending from so many years, I have learned that this is the best way of uh, driving the message home. So although this is not much interactive of a presentation, but uh, I will, it will still, I will make it work. So my first patient is a 55 year old gentleman who is an office executive who he checks into his primary care physician's uh, office thinking that he has a bad heartburn. His uh, past medical history is significant for hypertension and uh, he's a diabetic. Uh, and of course, he's a smoker from last um, 10, 10 years, uh, two packs every day. So he developed this chest discomfort, uh, epigastric and chest discomfort 50 minutes ago while he was working on his home exercise machine. And he describes the pain as crushing and constant, uh, seven out of 10 in intensity, but it does not travel to any other place like to his jaw, neck or to the, to the left arm. And he has some associated uh, nausea and dizziness, but not shortness of breath. And he has not uh, he has not lost his consciousness. So on on examination in the office, he is alert. He is distrusted. He is seen um, holding his chest with his hands, and he he is sweaty. A vital signs reveal that his heart rate is on the lower side, thirty eight, and his blood pressure is also on the lower side, 85 or 60. Other vital signs are more or less stable. His neck veins are flat and his chest examination does not reveal any, uh, any adventitious sounds and it's mostly clear. And his cardiovascular examination does not reveal any S3 murmur or rub and, 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 the, and the heart sounds are normally, uh, not normally auscultated. His abdominal examination and, and the is just reveals some epigastric tenderness, but in the extremities there is no edema, and but he has cold, clammy skin. So, with the scenario which I painted for you guys, what what would be the next step? What would you do in for this patient? So you have to mind that the patient has checked into his primary care physician's office, thinking that this is a heartburn. So, would you administer pain medication? In the office, would you call uh, 911 or activate emergency medicine system or get transthoracic echo uh, arranged or get an EKG? What would be the first thing to do with, with this kind of a story when you have this kind of a patient? Okay, you guessed it right. So you're gonna probably order a quick uh, electrocardiogram EKG. So, so he got an EKG in the office it was done within like a few minutes, couple of minutes. And the EKG shows that this patient has prominent ST segment elevations in the inferior leads. If you see second, third AVF here are all elevated here. And some of the, here's some reciprocal change in the, in the chest leads. 
So this is a classical case of inferior lead or inferior, uh, inferior wall myocardial infarction. So this patient is uh, suffering from a ST segment elevation MI. So this is a real cardiac emergency. Okay. And the presentation, unfortunately, many a times people think they are just suffering from a, like a heartburn. And, but in, in essence, they, they, they have a heart attack going on and which gets picked up later on. So he's in the office setting. So what will you do next? What will you do? Call, a, call 911, give him aspirin sublingually, put in an IV line or consider giving 500 cc's normal saline bolus. So what's the next step of your next step, next line of action in this, in this case? So, so I think the first one would be the most appropriate, but in the meanwhile, while the ambulance is make, coming to the clinic to pick this patient up, up, so you can, if you have aspirin available, you can give it sublingually. You can consider putting an IV line if you're able to put it quickly. Um, and in some cases, as I said, you know, patient, this patient has inferior wall MI and he has hypotensive and his, uh, his disease is symptomatic for that hypertension. You can consider giving a, um, a small bolus of normal saline as well. So, you know, coronary artery disease, it's one of the most common condition uh, prevalent worldwide more in the developing countries as well as in the developed countries. There's an impairment in the blood flow and the oxygen delivery to the myocardium gets impaired. It's a, it's a, it's a question of mismatch. How a timely identification of signs and symptoms is, is the key to the management of any cardiac ischemic disease. But we have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, coronary artery diseases are acute coronary syndromes. They don't present typically at, with typical signs and symptoms at all times. So in particular in females, it has, it's seen that they have atypical presentation. They may have right-sided chest pain or intrascapular chest pain or they can have shortness of breath, which is sometimes called as angina equine. So you have to be cognizant of atypical signs and symptoms as well. So the American Heart uh, Association estimates that there are every 41 seconds a, a person gets a heart attack. And of course, it's one of the leading causes of death in the United States and leading cause of uh, emergency visits as well. And in the United States alone, around 800,000 individuals, they get diagnosed with uh, acute coronary syndromes every year. With a median age, it's a, it's a disease of uh, older people mainly, 68 years and above, and with a male preponderance versus female in a, in a ratio of three is to two. So let's revise the pathophysiology a little bit. We, if you go back to your um, patho pathology knowledge, so, um, there's this early plaque formation, which, which starts when, even when the child is born, we get that fatty streak. And with the, with the advancing age, this, there is more plaque formation happens. And when uh, at a point this plaque, some, it ruptures or it, it causes thrombosis, you get the various uh, disease, disease states. Uh, like on the EKG, we, we can, we classify them on three, three types of um, three types like one is ST segment elevation MI the one I showed you just now the example ST segment depression uh, is the other one and then we have a non-diagnostic we can have a non-diagnostic or a normal EKG also. So coming back to this patient so the, the EMS has already alerted the ER that the patient is coming and uh, to, to, to that particular ER and there is a cardiac team also, they already know that there's a ST segment elevation MI coming their way and who, they have alerted the cardiac cath lab also. So while in the ER, the ER physician will perform a focus history and examination after, after of course, ensuring that the uh, airway, the breathing and the circulatory system, they are intact. And they will get the baseline labs, including the troponins, repeat the EKG and ch check a fibrinolytic checklist. So, and again, start with the basic management of the, um, uh, of the acute myocardial infarction uh, case, including aspirin and uh, administration of oxygen if their saturation is less than 90%. But 
but here we there's a there's a caveat that we have to be careful in our in case of our patient who is already hypotensive nitroglycerin uh, is is contraindicated um and we attach him to the to the cardiac monitors now it depends like what kind of a hospital this patient has been uh, shipped to if it's a it's a hospital which has a primary pci for cutaneous coronary intervention capabilities so then uh or is it a hospital where those availabilities are not the those those um, the cath lab is not available and how do we, that will determine how we manage the patient? So if in in this in the case of this patient, this he was uh, shipped to a, a PC, to a hospital where they could do a PCI primary PCI for him. So so there are some important time points we have to keep in mind. Uh, one is a door to balloon time. So if a patient comes from from the the time that he hits the ER, the PCI should be uh, done within 90 minutes. And if the hospital is not PCI capable, so then uh, they have to shift the patient out. Then still the time should it should not be more than within 100, 120 minutes. And in case the, the hospital is not available of doing a uh, PCI. So in, in such situations, we do thrombolysis. So in, in my previous practice, you know, I, I was a trained physician back in the uh, back in a resource um, limited nation. I have done a lot of um, uh, uh, these thrombolysis for the MI patients in the in the ER and in, in, in Kashmir where I trained, did my initial training. So of course, you know, this patient he got timely. Uh, PCI and they had he was he was stented for his MI. So the post majors of um, a, a myocardial infarction include developing disposition. If the patient uh, is still unstable, he go, can and he has a stent and he can go to ICU to be monitored. Uh, and we start on other guideline directory treatments, including beta blocker, ACE inhibitors, and lick, get a lipid lipid profile. And optimize the risk factors and the li lifestyle modifications, which includes like smoking cessations, weight, weight control, and so on and so forth. So this is the chain of survival in acute coronary syndrome, and each uh, each part of this chain link is very important. If it gets broken at one point, one place, so the patient will have a poor uh, poor outcome. So coming to the second case, this was a 70 year old uh, male who was admitted to my service for community acquired pneumonia. And he's, um, he had passed medical history for coronary artery, sorry, uh, chronic kidney disease stage three, and he was a diabetic and a hypertensive. On uh, admission to the hospital, he was hypotensive um, and he, had a, he was febrile, but he was saturating um, nicely on room air. He had already received two liters of IV fluids in the last 24 hours and, had, um, and his lactate had normalized by the time I saw him the other day. Uh, he, he had been started on appropriate antibiotics after being cultured. And in the morning time lab, um, the review of the lab showed that he still had some leukocytosis and the creatinine was 2.5, which was around his baseline. But I noticed that bump in his troponins, a slight increase. Um, so which, which, had, which had gotten unnoticed on, on admission. So I reviewed his EKG. So what do you think the EKG shows? So essentially, if we look at this EKG, it's a, it's a normal EKG. There's a, there's a P wave and a nice P wave and a QRS complex, and it's a science rhythm. Um, so for the sake of medical students, so I always tell medical students to to look at a lot of normal EKGs. So one, because there's a variation between normal EKGs also. And second, when they are able to uh, identify a normal EKG, they can identify abnormality within that normal EKG. So this patient had a normal EKG, but there was a troponin bump. So what is the diagnosis in this situation? Is it a ST segment elevation MI? Of course, this is not because the EKG is normal. Is it a non-ST segment elevation MI? Uh, or is it a type two demand mediated MI? Or is it is it just a lab variation? There's nothing, um, nothing to this. So probably this is a type three demand mediated um, uh, MI. Uh, 
again, these type two MIs, they occur secondary to acute imbalance in myocardial oxygen supply and demand. In, his, in this case, patient has a, has a pneumonia. He has already has some risk factors for coronary artery disease and his tro he has a troponin leak. This happened because there's a demand, excess demand, demand on the heart when he is acutely, when he's acutely ill with pneumonia. So you will see when you go to the clinical, uh, clinical um, training in the wards, you will see a lot of these type two MIs with the troponin bump on the inpatient acute medicine service. So what does this connote? So what do we do with this? So in the, in the case of this patient where, who has, the, in the, the case we are discussing, who has a pneumonia. So the cardiologist would say, that, hey, let's treat his infection. Let's keep on tracking his uh, troponins and let's see when they, they settle down and after the infection gets better, uh, we can risk stratify him and uh, address his uh, ca cardiac issues. And then depending uh, what we find, we can either do an inpatient risk, uh, this stress testing or outpatient uh, uh, stress testing and um, optimize cardiac, cardiac management. So let's move on to the case number third. So she was a 65 year old female who was admitted um, for shortness of breath from last three days. And uh, her, uh, her past medical history included um, hypertension, she was obese and uh, anxiety, depression, but most prominently she had history of metastatic breast cancer. I'm, I'm giving you the clue here, uh, history of metastatic breast cancer, but no history of heart failure, no history of coronary artery disease. On admit, she was in some respiratory distress. Uh, her blood pressure was, was good, but she, and she, she was hypoxemic at 89, mildly hypoxemic at 89% on room air, but febrile. So lab data was mostly normal, other than that she had a mild um, anemia, which was chronic. Her troponin was negative and initial EKG was with normal limits. There was nothing. Uh, to, in the initial EKG. So her admit ch chest X-ray showed she had a left moderate, left-sided uh, uh, moderate pleural effusion, but there was no other airspace disease. And she, she was already appropriately started on uh, my mild diuretic regimen, oxygen therapy, and there were talks with, the, uh, with our pulmonology uh, fellows to get her uh, pleural effusion tap. However, when I was when I started my morning rounds on the on the on the subsequent day, we got a like a RRT call, which is kind of an urgent call from the nurse that the patient had dropped the blood pressure uh, to 80 or 55, and she had more difficulty in breathing. So we went to the bedside. We saw that patient was anxious. She her heart rate had jumped up to 120 um, beats per minute, and she was she was cold and. Um, she was cold and calmy, clammy, and then the neck veins were full and they were less pulsatile. And she had a distant heart sounds as well. We ordered a stat chest X-ray and EKG for review, um, which happened within like next five, seven minutes. And the chest X-ray and the EKG results are shown. So on the, on the left side, if you see there, there's a big, uh, uh, cardiomegaly kind of a picture. Basically, this is a pericardial effusion, a lot of pericardial effusion and probably underlying she has on the left side it already has some moderate um, uh, pleural effusion also. And the interesting uh, picture is the EKG which shows that she has sinus tachycardia and if you can see uh, the in the lead second in particularly there are all the low, all the all the QRS complexes are of, are of low voltage, between five to ten mm. But there's alter, alternation of all this electrical alternance pattern, high and low altitude amplitude of the QRS complexes, and particularly it's best seen in lead two. So this is kind of gives us the idea that the patient has a cardiac tamponade uh, with the electrical alternance. So in this situation, what will you do next? So you're standing by the patient's side and you know you kind of have this idea that the patient has a pull, has this tamponade pathophysiology. What will you do? Would you try to organize a formal transthoracic echo, get a CT scan of chest, give more IV diuretics or 
or call a start cardiology consult. So I think, you know, both choice one and choice, uh, choice four, they're, they're, they're good choices. But, you know, to organize a trans formal transthoracic echo, it takes some time. In our hospital, we call, as in this situation, we would call a stat cardiology consult because the cardiology fellows or the attendings, they can uh, do bedside um, echo themselves and determine uh, if the patient has really has a tamponade uh, pathophysiology going on. So in the time we we could, by the time we call the cardiology fellow and they are coming, let's see what what are the common some of the common causes of pericardial effusion. So acute pericarditis is one of the most common causes, and acute peri, peri, in the acute pericarditis, the viral viral reasons for uh, pericardial effusion are most common, like Coxsackie virus and other viruses. So in it, depending like which part of the world you live in, like in Kashmir and in India, I have seen a lot of. Um, uh, pericardial effusions from tuberculosis also and in developing countries it's the autoimmune post mi and in our in the case of our patient it's met, probably metastatic cancer which is driving her per, huge pericardial effusion um, and there are some other causes as well so pericardial tamponade is a, is one of the one of the cardiac emergencies so Key to development of tamponade is how fast the pericardial fluid accumulates. If it's a small quantity of, if it's like a small quantity of fluid, um, but it, if it's, and it accumulates slowly, patient may tolerate this fluid. But if, if the same amount, let's say 150, 200 cc's, it accumulates quickly and rapidly, it can give, give rise to tamponade pathophysiology. And it has been described as, you know, in the old literature as Beck's triad hypotension and you can have non-pulsatile jugular veins, muffled heartbeats. But the thing is that you should not always look for classical presentations. You know, in clinical medicine, we always see this variation. We we have not, we don't have this classical presentations always present. So the emergent drainage of pericardial fluid is the mainstay of management. So in it can be done by cardiology service, CT surgery, or interventional radiology. It depends like who owns the patient, who has the time, and who can do it quickly. And analysis of fluid is to be done on case-to-case -case basis. But in, in case of our patient, we already kind of knew that this is probably metastatic, secondary to metastatic disease. The analysis would not make any sense. Sometimes you have to keep a drain there in situ to, to keep on draining if there's more accumulation of fluid. In chronic uh, cases, sometimes pericardial windowing window has to be to, to be um, maintained and um and you have to of course treat the underlying cause if possible but we, that's which and sometimes it's not possible to cause um impossible to cure the underlying disease in as in the case of our patient who had a metastatic process going on my last patient is a um, interesting 70 year old hispanic female who, who was admitted uh, for shortness of breath and some mild chest tightness from last few days. So she had uh, undergone left hip uh, replacement surgery a couple of weeks ago. Uh, she didn't have a lot of past medical history other than that she had COPD and osteoarth degenerative osteoarthritis of the knees and she was obese and hypertensive. And so when she came in the examination relieved that she was uh, mildly tachycardic and blood pressure was kind of okay, 100 over 65, um, but she was hypoxemic at 88% on room air. So, and systemic examination was non-contributory other than that she had a well-heeled well scar in, in, the, in her left hip area. So based on investigations were ordered, including the EKG, labs, and troponin. So mind you, this is a patient who has had a recent left hip replacement surgery. So I'm giving the key and the clue to you guys. So what imaging will help us to clinch the diagnosis? What single imaging would help us? What, what imaging would you order with this kind of information I gave you? Is it an echo, a chest X-ray, CT of the chest, um, CTNG of the chest, or a CT scan of the head? Uh, do you think it's all in the head? Patient has shortness of breath because of some other issue. Okay, you, you guessed it correctly. It's the, the single uh, imaging which will help us is the CT angiography of the chest because you were suspecting a PE in, in this situation. 
So we got a CTA of the chest. We showed she had a big uh, saddle embolus um, in, the, in the chest, as you see in the image. Big pulmonary embolism. So what is the next step in the management of this patient? How would you manage it? Start on aspirin? Uh, would you give a start on anoxaprine, call an ICU consult, or get an ultrasound of the legs, lower limbs, to see if she has a clot in there? So if you see this choice first, it, it doesn't make any sense. Your aspirin is not, indic is not indicated in this case. Starting on anoxaprine or heparin is the most appropriate action. Do you want to call ICU consult now? No, because the patient is hemodynamically stable. But can we need an ICU consult later on? Yes, probably. If she becomes hemodynamically unstable, which she has a potential for, because she has a big clot, saddle embolus. And do we need an ultrasound of the level, lower limbs? We may need it, but not right now. So most appropriate protection would be to start on a, a heparin drip, either an oxygen or a heparin drip. So again, pulmonary embolism, you know, it, it has a, a wide presentation. It can be incidental finding on a CT imaging, or you can, patient can come with a mass embolism shock, and sometimes it can lead to certain death. Um, and you know, acute whenever you get an acute PE pulmonary embolism, it causes elevated pressures in the pulmonary artery, and right heart pressures uh, get increased, and you get an acute core pulmonary kind of a pathophysiology. Sometimes it's reflected on the EKG by a classical Aspen Q3 T3 pattern. Um, but mind it, uh, this patient's EKG showed signs tachycardia with a rate of around 100, 100 ish. So, and she had Aspen Q3 T3 pattern. I will show you an EKG for that. And along with some uh, right bundle branch morphology. So, this is the EKG of the, for this patient. So, if you see, we, she has this. Um, S in lead one, Q wave here, and T wave, flip T waves. This is S in Q3, T3 pattern. Um, and along she had this bundle branch morphology in the P1. Now, of course, she's tachycardic. So let's re revise the EKG patterns in, in, the, in PE. What kind of EKGs do we get? So S in Q3, T3 pattern is one of the patterns, but it's not pathognomonic. It's kind of, you allowed to see it, but it's not always present. You can just be present in 12 to 50% of patients. And up to 25% of patients with PE, they have normal EKG at admission. And right bundle branch, as I said, is present, is again, there's a big, um, big range. 67% of patients will have this kind of a, right bundle branch, transit right bundle branch presentation. The most common presentation is a sinus tachycardia. This is like a question, a trick question they ask you in the, in the exams or in the boards. So sinus tachycardia is the most common presentation. And sometimes, you know, patients can have various kinds of arrhythmias, VPCs, atrial fibrillation, flutter, and you can see people nail kind of a pattern. So again, PE is a common medical emergency. It's easy to overlook and sometimes hard to diagnose. Early diagnosis and appropriate treatment is the key. There are some um, risk scoring systems available on Medline, uh, MedCal, sorry. Uh, and, and you can assess the pretest risk uh, of the PE. And uh, prevention of DVT is an important strategy to help in decreasing the clinical PE. In the case of our patient, we subsequently found that she had not been sent home on a DVT prophylaxis, although she got a hip surgery, and then she developed this big PE. So an appropriate level of care and specific treatment depends upon the hemodynamics of the patient. If the patient is in shock, patient goes to the ICU, and multimodality management may be needed, which, which, which means that if this, in case of this, let's come back to our patient. In, in case of this patient, if she would have developed shock, um, she would have needed thrombolysis. Thrombolysis can be, you can do an embolectomy. For that, you need to get surgeons involved. If you want to get a catheter direct lysis, then you, you get um, the inpatient interventional pulmonology or even inter interventional radiology involved. It's a multimodality uh, uh, management is needed for, for successful outcome, for good outcome for to the patient. 
So I think that's it for what I had arranged for you. Thank you. If you have any questions, I am available. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Javed Shah. We thank everyone today, who, everyone who has presented, all of the doctors and all of the participants. We thank you all for your time. And uh, I was Farida Hashem, the UGA ambassador of Bahrain, Eastern Junior ambassador. Be sure to write your questions in the chat box as the session will be held now by um, Mujtaba Shah, the Eastern Junior Ambassador of India. He will be handling the Q&A session. And uh, now we hand over to Mujtaba Shah. Thank you all. Um, I hope I'm audible right now. Yes, Mushtaba, we can hear you. Great. Thank you, Farida, for being such a nice host and uh, for the kind introduction as well. I'd like to thank Dr. Yasser Rashid, who spoke about uh, the respiratory emergencies, Mr. Janaris Kasanga, who spoke about the um, recognition of emergency signs and situations, CPR, uh, OSHA, and uh, poisons, and Dr. Javed as well, who spoke about the cardiovascular emergencies. Um, I would like to thank you all, all the three speakers, uh, for taking out their precious time, uh, taking out time from their busy schedules and for joining us uh, today. Thank you so much. Now we'll be having the question and answer session. Uh, keeping in mind the time, we'll try to include all, as many questions as we can, uh, but I don't think that we can, it will be possible to include all the questions. So let's get just started with that. So the first uh, question, we have for Mr. Janvis Kasanga. <clears throat> Can you just, uh, Mr. Janvis, are you with us? Sorry, my mic just had some problem. I wasn't able to unmute myself. So, generous, Mr. General is, is not available with us right now. Maybe is disconnected. Uh, moving on to a question for Dr. Yasser Rashid. Uh, Dr. Yasser. Sorry, I, I saw a couple of questions on the chat box. I think they were directed at me. One of them was that, do you break ribs while doing a CPR? Um, whenever we do CPR, and if the CPR is successful, we always do a chest X-ray to see for any problems that have, have maybe what there were problems in the chest that led to that cardiac arrest, but also to rule out any rib fractures, especially in old people whose uh, ribs could be more calcified and thinner bones there is a chance that ribs can be broken with CPR. So the answer is yes, ribs can be broken with CPR. And the second question um, was put up by someone saying that is asthma infectious? Asthma by itself is not an infectious disease. It is a disease of the airways. There are small muscles in the airways, small um, airways which are called bronchi. And those muscles um, for some genetic reason um, these patients have hyper response to airways. Their muscles become more uh, spastic or tight. Um, and that can be triggered by many things that, that can be triggered by allergens like pollens, dust, or cold, or exercise. There are many reasons for that to happen. 
but uh, is not an infectious cause. However, if patients suffer from any other infectious diseases of the lungs, like pneumonia, or um, say um, any other throat infections, then in those situations, asthma can be precipitated, it can go worse. But by itself, asthma is not an infectious disease. Thank you so much, Dr. Yasser, uh, for your answer. Uh, Dr. Yasser, we just had one more question about the risk of catching a disease while giving first aid. What about, about your, uh, according to your experience in the emergency room, what do you say about the risks of infections that are acquired by the healthcare workers, workers uh, while in emergency situations? And what measures can be possibly used to reduce the risk? Right, that's a very, very good question, actually. Because um, whenever you do um, attend to any emergency, um, which may involve um, acute basic life support or advanced life support, the first thing that you are taught in those courses is that, or is it safe for you to approach? Which means you should not, for example, if somebody has got such a poisoning that can be uh, that can affect you if you provide um, the help, then you have to make sure that you are safe first. So yeah, there are many, many things that have to be taken into account when you approach an emergency situation. You have to make sure that the environment is not dangerous for you. For example, if you go into a traffic accident, there's a risk of fire. If you go into an area where there's a chemicals, so that those chemicals can be dangerous to you. So you have to be very cautious. So you have to save yourself from those chemicals. You have to save from physical dangers, but also as we have recently seen in the last three years of COVID, we put on all this PPE and I, I almost, um, almost everybody must have uh, seen that and uh, many of you might have experienced. So the key reason for that PPE or personal protection equipment was to prevent yourself getting infected. So the same applies to um, in CPR situations, you also have to make sure that there are not any infectious diseases that may be, um, may be passed on to you while doing the CPR. So yes, you have to be careful, especially in respiratory viral diseases, it's, it's, it's important. Uh, there could be other diseases like open tuberculosis, so you have to protect yourself again, those things. So there are some infectious diseases that can be acquired through the inhalational route, which um, is important. And similarly, if you are doing a CPR in a patient, for example, who have got risk of other viral diseases, which can be bloodborne, so you have to take precautions to be careful using equipment where, there, where you may not get any, say, for example, needle stick injury. So again, the, the, everything, um, it could be physical danger, it could be chemical danger, it could be an infectious um, danger. So keep all that into account before you approach. That's what I would say. Thank you so much for your informative answer. Um, we have the next question for Dr. Javed. Yeah, go ahead. Dr. Dr. Javed, uh, there's a question. Is an ST elevation on EKG always pathologic? Uh, normally, it's always pathologic. ST segment elevation, uh, it comes with a myocardial infarction. We have damage to the myocardium. Is, it's, it means that patient has suffered um, myocardial infarction. You, you don't see a, uh, normally see a um, ST segment elevation uh, on the EKG. But, in the, uh, it's, it's not a normal normal thing to be seen on an EKG. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, and another question that we have uh, is, are there any types of chest pain that can mimic, uh, that can mimic a heart attack, cardiac arrest? That, like you already said that, that it is heartburn or maybe a reflux or something like that. Now, the question is, what are the interventions done in those cases, which are not a cardiac arrest? I think you know what we have. We have to understand is that you know there are atypical presentations. I think that's that's more more important. You know, many a times you know people sometimes they have a like in the case of in, in case of the example I I I I I I gave you. 
So this patient was thinking that he has a heart burn because he had an inferior wall MI, inferior wall MI. So it 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 many a times people just keep on going on for days together thinking that this is a heart burn and they they don't get they don't get checked um, they don't check in with their physician. So and you have to figure you have to think about atypical presentations as well as I as I stressed in particular in females. They they present with atypical presentations. They won't present with sometimes with the left sided precordial chest pain or pain going down the left arm or up, going up the jaw. So they can just present sometimes with a shortness of breath or right sided chest pain or intrascapular chest pain. So females have been known to present atypically. So that's very important. You have to recognize in the right setting if the patient has the coronary artery risk factor. So this may be cardiac issue. So they can simply be having shortness of breath, which is known as angina equivalent. You know? So that it, you have to, they have to report to the physician, and the physician has to take um, cognizance of, of those signs and symptoms in the right setting. Thank you so much, Dr. Javed. I hope that answer could uh, just clear it all. Uh, Dr. Yasser. Yeah, uh, we have a question for Dr. Yasser. This is, uh, the question is, what are the indications for intubating an asthma patient? So if you go back into my presentation, when I said uh, near fatal asthma, if the carbon dioxide level in the blood goes higher than normal, that probably would be a point where intubation happens usually. But also if their um, conscious level becomes low, their GCS falls, um, then you are thinking of intubating those patients if they are um, unresponsive, as I said, and if they uh, they are hypoxic, if their uh, PO2 levels, oxygen levels in the blood are too low, um, say less than eight, and then you are thinking, and they're not compensating for that, then you're thinking of intubating. Now, there are more things that you look at. Probably, I don't know what level I'm, I'm, aim, I'm trying to aim at a level of medical students, but we also look at their blood gases. We look at the acidosis in the blood because more carbon dioxide causes acidosis, less oxygen can cause. So there are um, other parameters in the blood that we can check uh, and, and their own respiratory fatigue, uh, looking at their peak expiratory flow rates already less than 33%. But also we feel like they are uh, fatiguing from respiratory point of view. They're not, uh, their chest expansion is not enough or they end up being what we called earlier as a silent chest. So they are all, but you have to look at the clinical picture of the patient. You have to look at the wholesome clinical picture when you take those decisions. But generally speaking for um, newly graduated doctors, whenever CO2 goes high, GCS drops, they should immediately call for help. That's what I would recommend rather than there it probably it's not their level that they will be deciding to intubate that patient. It's the recognition of those signs that's more important. Yeah, you are right, absolutely right. Thank you so much. And um, th there's one more question about the follow-up care after life-threatening attack of, of asthma. Like they're asking about the life uh, follow-up care after a patient has a life-threatening attack of asthma. Well, the follow-up care is, first of all, um, depending upon the seriousness of that life-threatening attack, whether they had to have intubation and mental intensive care, that's very serious. Or if they had severe asthma, which was managed with um, drugs um, and oxygen in the ward, generally, they are otherwise fit and well patients. Generally, if they've only got one disease, that's asthma, they recover from it very um, well. They, after a few days, they'll be back to their normal. However, Usually they are referred to their respiratory parent respiratory team who look after them um, for years. And then they keep on monitoring their uh, PEFR, monitoring their chest uh, function. And uh, sometimes they might need change of medicines in terms of maybe they start them on a steroid inhaler. Maybe they give them a dose of steroids for some time. Uh, if they had some infection, treat their infection. Essentially, the follow-up care would be referred back to their respiratory team. They will look after them and um, they will have to monitor their regular respiratory function for a few days to come until they go back to their normal state. 
and perhaps avoid um, triggers that have actually led to that asthmatic attack. If they are allergic to something, they avoid those allergens. If they had infection, treat that infection. Thank you so much, Dr. Yasser. Uh, now back to Dr. Javed. There's a question. Uh, I guess you can see it in the chat box. The question is, what, what if a patient comes with PTE? Uh, Dr. Javed. Is Dr. Javed with us? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, Dr. Javed, the, uh, the question is, a patient with PT who comes with a recent, uh, just let me open this. If a patient comes with PT and has a recent history of ICH, how can the dose of dosage of enoxaparin be adjust, adjusted? These are common situations, you know, we, sometimes we get a patient who has a pulmonary embolism and at the same time he has a GI bleed going on at any site, you know, in the head or like he's coming from the gut. So, you, and during those times, we have to make the determination, what do we do in this scenario? So, even sometimes they have a lot of clots in the, in the, in the legs and, you know, we, what we do some many a times is we will put a filter in, IVC filter. So, if patient cannot be anticoagulated using a heparin, so we can put a filter in. So, that's that's one, one situation where we put an IVC filter. It's one of the indications if somebody is actively bleeding. You can give up, uh, put on anticoagulation, you can give a filter. They put a filter in. So, typically, we use retrievable filters. We take it, we retrieve it after the acute situation and gets better, um, uh, like within like three to six months. Those filters, per se, they, they have the potential to develop thrombus on top. So, they are thrombogenic. Any foreign body is thrombogenic. So, they can develop uh, clots on the top. So, so this is this is the we we see this is the usual scenario. Many a times we see these situations: people having PE, they have ICH and and this bleeding, and they can't be anticoagulated. So we have to put, we put a filter in. Thank you so much, Doctor Javid. Um, now a final question to both of you. Since we are running short of time, I apologize uh, for the questions that we could not pick up for this question and answer session. Uh, we hope that in the next uh, programs uh, like this, we will uh, be able to take up all the questions and uh, uh, just, just uh, moving on to the last question, both of you, Dr. Javed and Dr. Yasser, from your experience as a healthcare provider, first responder or working in the ER, uh, what are some takeaway lessons from the COVID crisis now that we are heading, that we are he again heading towards yet another peak? Uh, Dr. Javed, you can go first. I think probably this COVID is going to... Dr. Javed going, first? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think it's going to stay. COVID is going to yeah. stay. So, but, you know, with the vaccines and uh, what we are seeing in the United States right now, a lot of people are not getting admitted to the hospital, although we have still have ongoing co community spread, but we are not seeing hospital admissions. You know, we and when the, during the peak of the COVID, we the whole hospital was filled with COVID patients. But we are the patients are coming with COVID now, not because of COVID. They have other issues, and they are on the side. We find that they have COVID also in the hospital. They are not. Uh, most of them are not intubated. Uh, many of them not do not go to ICU. So it's a different scenario. I think it's going to stay there in the in the in the community for some time. Uh, probably uh, as the immunity goes up, at it may be it may fade, or uh, if if God wills, it may just disappear, mutate. So, but it, it's it's going to stay. That's what I what I feel. And we are already giving the fourth dose of um, vaccine vaccine to to to, to physicians and different the frontline workers, and so on and so forth. So um, can I add a point as well? Thank you so much, Dr. Javed. So, Dr. Yasser. Yeah. yeah. So when we look at all these uh, influenza viruses and their history, historical uh, uh, spread, how, they, how the, uh, the pandemics happened in the past, they lasted three, four years and uh, things changed and immunity developed. And of course, the virus changes shape, it evolves as well. 
So, uh, but with current crisis, with COVID, um, it well, is one of the best examples of um, healthcare, um, especially researchers and scientists who developed the COVID vaccine so effectively and so quickly, which has helped to create a immunity in the in the community very fast, which actually tided over the crisis within a, one and a half years. Um, I fully agree with Dr. Um, Shah that uh, that it it's going to stay, but maybe it will it will, it will keep on emerging um, on and off. However, with the immunity that most of the people have in on Earth now, it will be limited to a mild disease uh, rather than severe. Except for those patients who are who have got multiple comorbidity, um, multiple comorbid conditions like advanced diabetes, renal failure who are on immunosuppressant drugs. For them, unfortunately, the immunity might not be as good. So those are the patients who will be still at high risk of getting um, severe disease from COVID. But the general healthy people will usually have nothing more than mild disease, I would guess. Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much, Dr. Yasser uh, Rashid. Thank you so much, Dr. Javid Shah. It was lovely having you here. Uh, uh, thank you so much, everyone, and all the speakers for their kind cooperation and uh, for, to the audience as well. I hope by listening to the expert views of both, uh, I, I mean, all the three uh, speakers that we had today, Mr. Janoris Kasanga was unfortunately not, be, uh, not, uh, was not able to join us um, uh, in this uh, question answer session. But thanks to Dr. Javed and Dr. Yas. I'd like to invite um, Leila. Rahma, Ms. Leila Rahma, the UJ, user and junior ambassador to Indonesia, uh, for the last part. Uh, Leila, over to you now. Uh, thank you for the time you have given me. I'm UGA from Indonesia. Now that we are in the end of the event, I would like to say a big thank you for the speaker who are very extraordinary. Hopefully what has been conveyed by this presenter can be useful for all of us. I would also like to thank the organizers of the first eight for international health this event, in particular to my colleagues, UGA from Bahrain, India, Kyrgyzstan, Kenya, and Gambia for making this event possible. And also a big thanks for the collaborating organization that have supported this event, the Health Commission of the Overseas Indonesian Student Association Alliance, the Indonesian Student Association in Iran, Peruni Tiongkok, OSIAA in the region of Middle East and Africa, IDE Indonesia, and Red Cross of Indonesia in the Kassar Regency. Thank you to all participants who have attended this event. This event is a three-day event, so we still have Persian language session tomorrow and Indonesian language sessions on, on Thursday. Participants who have already registered are expected to attend this event as well. Besides this event, UGA Collaborative Event will also hold a mental health talk show on 10th October, which coincides with World Mental Health Day. And also at the end of the year, we will hold a seminar on research ethics and research methodology. I would also like to invite you all to the annual UCERN Congress, which more information about this can be found on the UCERN website and social media platform on individual member countries. Please anticipate these events, and we are looking forward to your participation in future user events. Thanks again for your presence. And before leaving this Zoom, we will have a photo session together so that all participants, please open your cameras. Uh, and we will have a photo shoot and we'll screenshot this for our memory. Please open your camera. I think everyone still not open their camera. We will wait for a sec. Next, for the next page, one, two, three.
for the next page. One, two, three. Next, one, two, three. One, two, three. Oh my God, we still have a lot. <laughs> okay, next page. One, two, three. I think um, that's it. Thank you so much, everyone, for your um, participation. We will looking forward for your participation later in Eastern events. Thank you. Bye bye. Now you can speak. <laughs>Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Uh, one thing that I've got, uh, can you ask questions about other businesses too or not? Yeah. Hello, everyone.